So over the last 24 hours, the government has sought to further tighten the already strict security arrangements in place in managed isolation facilities in order to prevent, prevent any further breakouts. And I want to start by repeating the point the Minister of Health made yesterday. Anyone who chooses to break out of these facilities is committing a reckless act of selfishness and we will come down on them with the full weight of the law. They are putting New Zealanders at risk and undermining our efforts to keep COVID out of the community. Frankly, they don't deserve to join the team of five million. While these facilities are not prisons, they do have 24-7 security and fences to keep returning New Zealanders inside. And I want to emphasise that the vast bulk of returnees comply with the rules and cause no problems. Nearly 30,000 New Zealanders have already been through these facilities and the general feedback from these people is that it is a positive experience and they cause absolutely no issues. The fact that we have so far avoided any spread in the facilities is a testament to the fact they are generally well run and people are generally well behaved. But the facilities are a snapshot of society and there will inevitably be the odd problem. We must ensure our security arrangements anticipate the type of behaviour we are seeing from the worst of our returnees. So we are announcing um, that as of today, um, there will be a permanent police presence at every managed isolation and quarantine facility in New Zealand 24-7, which Air Commodore Webb will outline the details of shortly. In regard to the process for deciding on early releases from managed isolation facilities in exceptional circumstances, this is work that we have been progressing. Um, we are continuing to build a strengthened process for early releases. We've worked extremely hard over the past couple of weeks to build a safer, stronger exemptions process and a number of systemic improvements have been made. As you know, people returning to New Zealand must enter managed isolation for 14 days and return a negative COVID-19 test before they can leave into the community. However, there are a small number of exceptional circumstances in which people can apply for an exemption to leave a facility. These include medical exemptions which are granted in situations where a, per a person's serious health needs mean they cannot safely stay in the managed isolation facility. They also include exemptions for other reasons, however these have been suspended since the 16th of June while assessment, compliance and enforcement processes have been worked on. We need to be sure the processes for allowing people to leave manager, managed isolation early is without any weakness or uncertainty. Applicants will need to return a negative COVID-19 test before approval is granted. A COVID-19 exemption compliance team within MB is being established and a strengthened assessment process is being put in place. This will include a health assessment to determine the urgency of the request and any health risks the applicant may present. Those in quarantine facilities would be highly unlikely to be considered low risk in the context of an exemption application. That's quarantine as opposed to managed isolation. And an update on other work, work is underway to transfer legal authority to oversee a number of critical procedures around this, including authorising exemption, um, exceptional exemptions to the Chief Exec Executive of MB. An updated air border order will be in place next week after the Minister of Health um, gazettes that, and that will have an updated system for processing exceptional exemptions. We anticipate at that time our updated system for processing ex exceptional exemptions will go live. So I'll now hand over to Air Commodore Webb to provide an operational update and the immediate steps taken over the incident with the abscondee from the facility on Tuesday night. Thank you, Minister. As of today, we have seen 27,723 New Zealanders return home and go through managed isolation and quarantine since the 26th of March. There are currently 5,648 people in managed isolation and quarantine. Our current effective capacity is 6,380, and this gives us an excess capacity of 732. Over the next week, we're projecting 2,418 arrivals and 2,762 departures from managed isolation, giving a net reduction of 344 people in managed isolation over those seven days. 
As you know, on Tuesday night, an individual absconded from the smoking area of a managed isolation facility in Auckland. I want to emphasise that this individual breached rules that are clearly outlined and he will be charged as a result. It's important to recognise that almost 28,000 people have been through these facilities, 8,000 of them in the last three weeks. Everyone who goes into managed isolation knows the rules and over 99.97% of them have followed those rules without any problems. This individual didn't and there are consequences to that. However, it's also important that we constantly evaluate policy and process settings to make sure they are as effective as possible. We'll never be able to entirely remove the risk of someone making a choice to break the law. This is true in managed isolation just as it is in general society. But our job is to make sure that the law is backed up by as many preventative measures as practical. Yesterday I said that we'd be reviewing our security and police presence at managed isolation facilities. We currently have contracted guards on site 24-7 at every facility. While they do not have powers to detain, they work very closely with site staff and the police to monitor activity and respond to any events. The police have already committed significant resources to support managed isolation and quarantine with dedicated patrols assigned to facilities and a 24-7 presence at a small number of facilities and the Jet Park quarantine facility. Since my update yesterday, the police have agreed to have a uniformed officer on site at each managed isolation facility 24-7. Integrating the New Zealand police into the on-site security teams will go a long way towards ensuring necessary compliance. In addition to this, we have worked to arrange for a lead security position at each managed isolation facility. This person will be a senior security professional responsible for overseeing the security presence on site and ensuring policies and processes are tight and well understood. We expect to have these people on site in the next 24 to 48 hours. I also discussed yesterday that this individual absconded from a smoking area at the facility and this prompted us to look at our policy around smoking more generally. There is strong health advice that effectively forcing someone to quit smoking while already in a heightened state of stress is likely to lead to an increase in that stress and aggressive behaviour. We recognise that for a lot of people in these facilities, their return to New Zealand represents a time of dramatic change in their lives, and a part of our job is to make sure that that period of managed isolation is as stress-free as possible. For this reason, banning smoking in these facilities would not be appropriate at this stage. However, based on the behaviour of a couple of individuals, it is clear that this is an area of risk for absconding and we want to address that. All smoking areas will be monitored 24 hours a day and if for any reason that monitoring cannot occur, for example during a shift change, smoking areas will be closed. Furthermore, fencing as a visible deterrent has also, be, also been strengthened and I can tell you that all facilities that require fencing have now had six foot high fencing installed. As mentioned yesterday, we've been reviewing CCTV footage from the supermarket and the Auckland CBD to establish a minute-by-minute -minute understanding of the individual's movements. He was logged into the smoking area at 6.51pm and escaped via the fence section being replaced. He walked to the countdown, taking a relatively indirect route, arriving at 7.02pm. As reported, he spent 20 minutes there. He then took a phone call for 22 minutes and that call ending at 7.42pm. He then took an indirect route back to the hotel, arriving at 7.58pm. During this time, he walked along Albert Street, Custom Street East, Queen Street and Victoria Street West. 